Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining this webinar. My name is Kate Tantakis and I am a member of the USDA Hemp Production Program team. I'm here to talk to you about obtaining a USDA producer license and what it means once you are licensed with the program. So this talk is specifically geared towards pilot program participants who are going to be transitioning to the USDA license on November 1st. I'm going to be flipping back and forth between a prepared PowerPoint and the website so that you guys can follow along as I talk, as I grab resources, show you where applications and reports are, as well as additional information about the program. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and we can get started. I wanna start by providing a little bit of background. In 2014, the Farm Bill allowed hemp to be grown in the US under state pilot programs that were research-based. The 2018 Farm Bill removed hemp as a controlled substance, got rid of the requirement to have a uh, research program and directed the USDA to develop a domestic hemp production plan. So under this USDA plan, we are able to license individuals and we're also able to approve state plans and tribal plans that follow our interim final rule, the rules laid out that will soon be finalized next year in 2021. So you are members of states that opted not to submit a plan, but have you, the producer, come to the USDA directly. So I'm gonna pan over to the website for the first time. We're gonna start at ams.usda.gov, go to rules and regulations, and hemp. And this is where we'll begin. On this page, you can find the 2018 Farm Bill at the top here. You can find the interim final rule, which are the rules that the USDA follows with their program and the rules that all state and tribal approved plans must follow as well. And down below, you'll see a webinar for uh, just an overview of the program, a bit more detail about how it came to be, what are the rules that it um, follows, some stuff I'm going to skip over here. Today, what I really want to talk to you about is getting your USDA hemp license, what it takes, what it means once you have it, record keeping requirements uh, throughout your term of growing with us, as well as the four most important activities of any USDA licensed producer. The first being reporting land to FSA. The second being finding and arranging a sampling agent to come and take a pre-harvest sample finding a testing laboratory to test those samples, and finally, disposing of non-compliant crops. So that's what I'm gonna discuss here today. Let's dive into the first topic, which is your USDA hemp license. So these licenses are valid for a term of three years until December 31st of that third year. The license document itself will show your business or individual name, your license number, and your date of issuance and expiration. These licenses won't renew automatically, but as you come up to that date of expiration, we will notify you um, that it's about time to renew and we'll give you instructions on how to do that. Licenses aren't transferable. And at this time, we don't have any formal amendment process for making changes to your license information. Simply send us an email at this farmbill.hemp.usda, excuse me, at usda.gov that's listed on the slide. This email is going to be your best point of contact as a grower, whether it's asking questions on how to fill out the application, once you're a grower, where certain resources are, what your obligations are, anything that you need to ask us, um, this email goes directly to myself and my colleagues who work on the program. I do wanna mention that uh, some states may have additional licensing requirements for hemp growers. Top of the mind is any nursery growers who are selling stock, transplants, clones, things like that. You may need to contact your State Department of Agriculture for additions, excuse me, additional licensing requirements. And if you have any questions about your particular operation and if there are any additional requirements that you have to meet, shoot us an email and we will let you know. So with that, I wanna take a look at the website this fourth section over here, USDA licensed producers, is going to be your go-to, not only for your reporting forms, which we see in the middle here, but also additional resources that pertain to the application process, 
And after, you know, after you're licensed, if you want loans, grants, um, pesticide information is below as well. So this is going to be your go-to section of our website for finding these resources about hemp growing in the USDA's program. The first thing we'll take a look at is the license application. So all USDA documentation has instructions on the first page. Here we see that um, there is a discrete application period, August 1st to October 31st. Please disregard this application period. We are accepting them on an ongoing basis um, for 2020. And if there are any changes, we will update the website accordingly. So keep an eye on that. But for now, please continue to submit applications past October 31st. You'll also see additional information about the application process. Very important here is submitting an FBI background check with your application. We will not accept um, applications that do not have this criminal history report and the criminal history report can be no older than 60 days at the time of submission with your application. So let's go back and uh, on our website, the first bullet here is the FBI criminal history report. This link brings you directly to the FBI's website where they go over how to submit a request for this background check. At the top of the page, they also maintain the most up-to-date processing times for these background checks. So you can plan appropriately when to begin this process, when to expect it to be ready for your application. We can see that as of today, it is three to five business days if the request is submitted electronically and up to 12 weeks if you submit the request for a background check by mail. So keep an eye on that page, it's going to be a handy resource for you. And looking at the rest of this application here, we see that um, simple personal information and business entity information is required. The criminal history report is required. And on this last page, we need an attestation as to who has legal authority over the land on which you intend to grow. You'll notice that we're not asking for growing addresses or GPS coordinates. This detailed information about where you're going to plant hemp will be given to the Farm Service Agency after you have your license. So we'll discuss that step later. This is the first step that you take once you receive your license. But on the application, we do not need that information. A final note I want to make here is that business entities, research institutions, universities are required to list the titles of key participants. Key participants are persons who have direct or indirect financial interest in the entity, such as an owner or a partner. Um, for research institutions and universities, that would be any professor or a person who has a control or a stake in that program. So each key participant must be listed for the business and must get their own criminal history report and submit that with the application. So those are the key things to note on the application and um, when submitting that. So our processing time is relatively quick with the license. Once you have it in hand, um, you can start to consider things like record keeping. Once you have that license, record keeping begins. We need you to maintain records of where you're growing hemp, where you're getting your hemp seed from, when you're planting, um, you know, any methodology that you're using to harvest or maintain those crops. USDA will do random audits or inspections of license holders at any time. So make sure that you have this information on hand. If you have questions about what's necessary to keep track of, send us an email and we will let you know. So with record keeping, you also have a requirement to report certain information that you keep record of. And on the website, you'll see those two reporting forms. The first is a disposal report form. And this report must be submitted no later than 30 days after the disposal is complete. And when we talk about disposal, we mean specifically in regards to non-compliant or hot crops. So this is the disposal report form. You see that we need information about the location as well as the date that the disposal was completed. This lot number ID in the top left corner will be given to you by the Farm Service Agency when you go and register your locations with them. 
Once again, we'll talk about that number and what it means to register um, on the next slide. One thing I want to make note of is this disposal agent information, as well as the directions above that state that disposal must be handled by a DEA registered reverse distributor. This requirement by the DEA has been waived until October 31st, 2021, unless uh, gone away with by the final rule that comes out. Essentially what that means is you are not required to have a DEA registered reverse distributor dispose of your non-compliant hemp. You are able to do that yourself. Uh, later in this presentation, we'll talk about disposal methods that you are able to take with your hot crops. So the second report form that um, you must submit is only required to be submitted once a year on December 15th, and this is your annual report. Essentially, what we're looking for is the amount of crop planted, disposed, and harvested in each of your growing locations. So just like the last form, it's just a one-page report document that's fairly straightforward. If you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Our contact information is always on the front page of the reports and applications. So with that, we move to the four main activities you must do once you receive your license. The first being reporting to FSA. For new farmers or people who are just getting into hemp, um, registering your acreage with the FSA may be new to you. Essentially, the Farm Service Agency collects and stores location information about where certain crops are. We share that information with the DEA and with law enforcement. So this step is crucial to making sure that law enforcement, both at the local, state, and federal level, know where your hemp crop is, know that it's compliant, know that it's registered, and know that it is certified by us um, to be in that location. So this is a very, very important step that we encourage you to take as soon as you are able to. Um, ideally, this would be done before planting, but below you can see some of the information that FSA needs when you're registering. They not only need to know your planting dates and irrigation practice, but they wanna know your hemp seed information, intended use of your crop, and also where on a map these lots are. So, the lots that FSA will designate are determined uh, based on this definition of lot. A contiguous parcel of land that has the same variety of hemp growing on it. So whether it is a, a parcel of land, a physical field, or a greenhouse or a hoop house, if you have multiple varieties of hemp, it will be divided into separate lots based on those number of varieties. If you have a parcel of land that has a river through it or a fence structure that separates it into multiple parts, that will divide it into lots further. Now, the definition of lot is important here because every lot that you have needs to be sampled and tested for THC compliance before you're able to harvest and sell that material. So your local FSA office can give you more information about um, what, how many lots you have, based on the photo that you show them of your property and the number of varieties that you plan to grow. But it's definitely something to consider as you are planning out your, your next year of harvest. So before we move on to the next activity, I do wanna to point to some resources on our website. The first being crop acreage reporting. This is a PDF that FSA has given to us. It helps first time farmers and um, new growers with the USDA get acquainted with the Farm Service Agency and how to register acres. There's a number of uh, FAQ on the first page and the second page here, as well as more information about what the FSA needs when you go into the office to register those acres. There's resources on how to find your local office, but I will refer back to our website and find that link directly on our page. This fourth bullet here, Farm Service Agency Field Office Locator, will bring you right to their page where you can click on your state. Let's go to Broome County and see exactly where FSA is located. We see that USDA has two service centers, one in Binghamton and one in Cortland. Only the Binghamton office has a Farm Service Agency located in this service center. 
So if we click into that FSA link, we can see contact information for uh, the director and another manager who works there. If you've got questions about this process, you can reach out to them directly if you're in Broome County um, and also reach them by phone or fax as well. So that's everything you need to know about the FSA and registering lot numbers. Um, be sure to keep those lot numbers handy for your reporting. Um, it's critical for us that you do this step as soon as possible. So moving on to activity number two. Since you are coming from a pilot program, you are likely used to your state or regulatory authority arranging for sampling and testing for you to determine compliance. As a member of the USDA program, you are required to arrange sampling yourself. What this means is you are in charge of finding a sampling agent to come out and do the sampling. You are responsible for making sure the sampling agent is aware of how to do those uh, samplings, how to take those cuttings. Um, and it's also your responsibility to find a testing laboratory for them to mail that sample to. And this is a new industry need sampling agents as a whole that um, the hemp industry is just being introduced to uh, with the USDA program. So we are still working on building resources for you all as to how to find those sampling agents. And it's important that as we begin November 1st to license these, uh, these new program participants that you all are sharing information about sampling agents. Um, sampling agents cannot be any person who has a stake in your business or um, a family member. We are looking ideally for off-duty law enforcement, um, maybe extension officers who are off-duty as well, um, or testing laboratories who wish to offer sampling as an additional service. So as we gain more information about this space, um, we will be sure to share it with you all. Um, but this is something that we recommend you have determined 90 days before harvest. This allows you to schedule your appointment at least 45 days before harvest. And within 15 days of harvest, you need to have this sample taken. If your crop is still in the ground, you can do as many samples as you would like, um, but we have to have a sample at least 15 days prior to harvest. Um, it can be closer to harvest, um, but no later than. So let's go to the website and take a look at some of this information that we want you to share with sampling agents. Information for sampling agents is pretty straightforward. It's the link you'll go to to find some of these guidelines. So this first PDF here, Guidelines for Sampling, gives you information on the process. The equipment required, um, how many cuttings per acre, what portion of the plant to take a cutting of, uh, this details all of the requirements. The second PDF here is a guideline for sampling agents in particular. Now, this resource gives sampling agents additional information on the program as a whole, some quick facts, um, what is a sampling agent, why do they need to take the sampling uh, testing module, that I'll show you on the next PDF here, um, and just some quick facts about what it means to be a sampling agent what is this new requirement? So this sampling training module that I mentioned is a presentation based training that we recommend all sampling agents uh, get familiar with before going out into the field. It overviews the requirements of the interim final rule, what their role is, chain of custody and best practices. So this is really crucial to ensure your sampling agent is familiar with. Um, whether that is something you share with them directly or whether their business practice shares with them. So we mentioned finding your own testing laboratory. You are responsible for making sure that the testing laboratory you select follows the rules of the interim final rule as well, the same way that sampling agents must follow those guidelines. So for testing labs, we're looking for labs that use post decarboxylation or other similarly reliable methods. They must report total THC on a dry weight basis. That's the sum of delta-9 THC and THCA, the acid. 
testing laboratories will send you, the producer, and us, the USDA, a copy of the test results. Um, so you don't have to worry about sharing that information with us. We expect to receive it at the same time you do. Now, to assist you in finding laboratories that meet the requirements of our interim final rule, we have a tab on our website titled Hemp Analytical Testing Laboratories. You can search by location for labs that have attested to us that they are aware of the requirements of the IFR and they, they, uh, they test material in accordance with those rules. So definitely check out this resource as you're looking for a laboratory um, to utilize. So the final activity is disposal of non-compliant crops. We saw the disposal report earlier um, for disposal of these crops. Your options for disposal are plowing under, disking, mulching, burial, burning. Um, there are a number of methods that you can use when disposing of non-compliant crops. So I will mention that you are able to test your hemp as many times as you would like, as long as it is in the ground. Whether you receive a hot test um, result, you are able to retest that material as long as it's still a standing crop. The minute that it's harvested, um, if those results come back hot, we cannot do any further testing or sampling of that material. Um, it must be disposed of. So with that, we wrap up the activities that you must do every year as a member of the USDA Hemp Production Program. Report to FSA, your growing locations for that year, take those pre-harvest samples, have a lab test that material, and dispose of anything that comes back as non-compliant. You're not required to grow every year that you hold this three-year license. Uh, there's no minimum or maximum acreage. But any year that you are in operation, please make sure that you're doing the, the affirmation into activities. So with that, um, that wraps up sort of the, uh, the ins and outs of being a USDA licensed producer. As you saw on our website, there's a host of information regarding pesticide use, grants, loans, um, a suite of uh, resources that are available to you as a member of the USDA uh, production program. As I said before, please feel free to email us any questions you have at any time about anything. We will do our best to help you along through this transition. Um, please begin to get those background checks done if you need to be licensed on November 1st and uh, begin working on those applications. Thank you all again for joining this webinar and uh, we look forward to working with you.